Hello, family and friends. It's day 82 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. I am Kanoi. Welcome to another day, a new season. Yesterday was a little bit heavy, a bit of a sob fest as we said goodbye to Moses. But today we get to enter into the promised land with Joshua at the helm. We are reading Joshua chapters one through four. But before we get started, if you could help us out by liking this video, giving it a thumbs up so that we can help continue to spread the word and get people passionate for the word of God. Also make sure you're connected with us in our Facebook group. You can find that link in the description box below. And also let's start off this season once again with a heart of gratitude. Tell me in the description box below three things that you're grateful for. There's nothing too small nothing too big for us to say I am so thankful for this for me today I'm excited because we're getting ready to go on an RV trip with my family to my daughter's state championships in gymnastics which I covet your prayers for traveling mercies grateful for a new coffee that I tried this morning that a friend gifted to me I am grateful for an extremely generous offering that came in last night that is literally taking us across the Jordan into the promise, expanding this ministry, helping us to purchase equipment to build out the podcast and to get us ready for the next chapter. And I am just thankful for all of you and for how you pour into this, both spiritually, physically, through your words, through your sweet gifts. And my heart is just overflowing today. So Lord, I thank you for you first and foremost. You are God Almighty. You are so good to us. Thank you for being our Father who loves us unconditionally and who is always ready and willing to be there for us and to lead us every single day. I thank you for every person here in this Bible study, Lord. You have chosen each of us to be here today together, to gather together, Lord, so that your presence could dwell where we gather. And so I pray today as we come in obedience and humility before you, that you will open up our eyes, our ears, and our hearts to hear from you, Lord. Will you open up the heavens and let your rain pour out upon us? Help us to keep our eyes fixed on you in everything that we do in every moment of our lives. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before we start the book of Joshua, I did want to take us back to something yesterday that someone asked about because I did men mean to mention this and I just forgot. If you notice when Moses was giving his blessings upon the tribes of Israel, Simeon was not included in this blessing. And there's no specific reason given as to why Simeon did not receive a blessing here, but there are several schools of thought. One of them is that, if you remember, Simeon and Levi were the two brothers that took vengeance upon the cities that the men who raped Dinah, their sister, came from. So after their sister Dinah was raped, they went in and they just ravaged the city. And God was very displeased with them for that. And therefore, when Jacob gave them their blessing, he said, weapons of violence are their sword. Let my soul come not into their counsel. Oh, my glory be not joined to their company. So he basically separated these two brothers from the rest. Now we know that Levites have been set apart for the Lord and for his service, but also the Levites didn't receive any inheritance. And then Simeon was one of the smallest tribes. And it actually said that they will be divided. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So we know that the tribe of Simeon was likely scattered and they were absorbed into the tribe of Judah. They end up sharing the inheritance with Judah. So that's one of the thoughts that perhaps they were just scattered. They were absorbed and that's why they didn't receive a blessing. Another school of thought was that they received the blessing by way of the general blessing in the end when he said that, where did he say it? When he says it here in verses 26 through 29, uh, just mentioning Israel as a whole. So that could have been a general blessing onto Simeon as well. So the book of Joshua begins right after the death of Moses, somewhere around 1406 BC, according to scholars. They believe that the author, at least some of it, is written by Joshua because it literally says these are the words that Joshua wrote. Uh, some of the themes, be strong and courageous right from the get-go. The Lord says this several times, and this book will span across little less than a decade, about 10 years. And we are going to see not only the possession of the land or the promised land where the Israelites are crossing over the Jordan, but also a reminder, constant reminder of the covenant that God has made with his people. And the name Joshua means the Lord saves, which the Greek 
form of Joshua or the Greek name is Jesus. So this is why we symbolically relate Jesus as our Joshua, the one who's going to take us into the promised land. So we begin here in chapter one, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. So let's break this down here for a second. Servant of the Lord. Um, this is only given to four people in the Bible, this, this phrase here. It's given to Moses here that we see. It's going to be given to Joshua, David, and also to Jesus. So this is a really honorable uh, term. And then Moses' assistant, speaking of Joshua, this is seen in other translations as the word minister or servant. So the fact that he is being appointed the leader now of millions of people, well, he started small. So never despise the day of small beginnings because greatness always starts small. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them. So the Lord is the one giving them the land to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised Moses. So the Lord has given them this land from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. This is about 30,000 miles that the Lord is saying, this is my gift to you. However, we know that they fail to completely partner when they speak of the sole of the foot treading upon. Well, God is saying, I've given you the land uh, just as God is giving us the ability to walk into the promised land through Jesus. He gives us Jesus when he says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. But with every place that the sole of your foot treads upon, it's a matter of possession. They are gifted the land, but they have to possess the land. Their feet have to walk upon the land in order for them to take possession of it. So we too have to partner with Jesus, the gift that we've been given, and walk with him in order to take hold of the promise on this side of heaven, because the promised land speaks not only of heaven, but also the spirit-filled life here on earth. So again, 30,000 miles that they're given, but they only claim 3,000. So they partner with him, sort of. <laughs> Verse five, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. So be strong and courageous for you shall cause this people to inherit the land. So this is going to be Joshua's first job is to divvy up the land, to get the people to the land that I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous. Second time he's saying this, anytime the Lord repeats himself, you better listen, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant commanded you do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you will be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. The word of God not departing from your mouth. We'll never have the ability to speak the word of God if it is not down deep in our hearts and in our souls. So this is going to take time. This takes effort. This takes diligence for us to come to the word, read it, meditate on it, write it, whatever it takes for you to commit it to memory. Because out of the overflow of the heart is where the mouth speaks. So the word has got to dwell in your heart. Now, second of all, he says that you shall meditate on it day and night. Well, the word meditate in the Bible actually translates to chewing the cud. We've seen that terminology used with animals that are clean and unclean. We're going to have a little lesson in agriculture here right now. Cows chew the cud. And when they do this, they take in the food, they chew it up, and their saliva starts to break it down. Now, a cow also has two stomachs. So when it swallows it the first time, it goes into the first stomach of the cow and the food begins to break down into protein and energy. And then the cow regurgitates it back up into its mouth. That's the cud. And then it starts to chew it once again before it swallows it again and now goes into the second stomach where it is fully digested. So when God tells us to meditate on the word, we've got to be taking it in, chewing on it, thinking about it, swallowing it, redigesting it, chewing on it again, swallowing it again before it gets down into our hearts. So for us, reading the word brings in all the information, but it's in the meditating on it that then creates a transformation in our spirit.
So by doing these things, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Third time God is saying this. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And this is the biggest part of the equation because you can have all the might. You can be strong. You can be courageous. But without the spirit of the Lord, they will not have success and they will not have victory. And a testimony of God speaking, be strong and courageous three times here. We will see Joshua actually use these words. Then we will see David speak them to Solomon. So that just goes to show that when children hear words, when we hear the words, we will be repeaters of the word because it will flow out of our hearts. Verse 10, and Joshua commanded the officers of the people. So we started here. So we started off here with the spiritual preparedness of Joshua, and now we're going to see them uh, appointing officers. So Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions for within three days, you are to pass over this Jordan to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. So this is going to be a waiting period, this three days before they cross over. So he needs them to get prepared to have food, water, all the things that they need. And to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, y'all got to fight, Joshua said. <laughs> Just kidding. I wrote that there. But he is saying this. Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying that the Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. But your wives, little ones, and your livestock will remain in the land that, the Mos that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the men of valor, <clears throat> that is the elite, the Navy SEALs, if you will, all the men who are willing to fight, among you shall pass over, armed before your brothers, and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your brothers as he has to you, and they also take possession of the land that the Lord your God is giving them. So you got your land, but you still got to fight so that your brothers can get their land. Then you shall return to the land of your possession and possess it, the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan toward the sunrise, so on the east side of the Jordan. And they answered to Joshua, all that you have commanded us, we will do. And wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. So they are showing obedience and loyalty here. And they are therefore affirming Joshua's leadership over them. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your commandment and disobeys your words, whatever you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Chapter 2. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. Now, this could make us immediately think that, uh oh, they're lacking faith because that's what happened when they sent in the spies before. But this is not a lack of faith. This is actually spies so that they can prepare for what is ahead of them. So this is an act of faith for them to send the spies in. And he did so secretly just in case what happened last time where it was a public display of everyone freaking out that the land was scary and they're telling all the people. He sent these guys secretly so that they would not come back uh, with any kind of bad report for the people. And so he said, go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and they came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. There's no explanation as to why they chose Rahab, but scholars believe it is so that they could remain anonymous because this would be the only place in the city that they could go where, you know, it wouldn't be spoken of who was there. But it didn't work. It was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men did come to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. So I don't know where the men went out. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and she hid them with stalks of flax that she had laid in order on the roof. So their roofs were flat tops and they usually would put these stalks of flax, which were used to create linens, uh, and they would lay them out to dry. So the men were hiding underneath these stalks of flax. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. So Rahab obviously lied here. This is not condoned by the Lord. It is a simple fact that is being stated as to what happened. 
so lying, not an honorable trait, but her courage here to do so is honorable. Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. And when she uses this term, the Lord, she is saying Yahweh. So she knows the Lord by name. So she actually is a woman of faith. And that the fear of you has fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. So she's mentioning one of the miracles that the Lord had done before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. So another thing that they heard about. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. So this is a declaration of her faith right here. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us this land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. So they are asking her to bear false witness. They are asking her, don't tell the information that you're going to know. Again, not honorable, not something that the Lord condones, but this is something that happened. So then she let them down by a rope through the window for her house was built into the city wall. And I wrote here, these were uh, humble dwellings, which would be normal for the case of a prostitute to live within these double walls. Um, and the reason why there was double walls is because it was a fortified city. It was a city that really couldn't be penetrated. So she lived in that wall and she said to them, go into the hills. So she's sending them west because the only mountains... Uh, are to the west here. So that's how we know that she sent them west, but she sent the other guys east. Or the pursuers will encounter you and hide there three days until the pursuers have returned. Then afterward, you may go your way. The men said to her, we will be guiltless with respect to this oath of yours that you have made us swear. So behold, when we come into the land, you shall tie this scarlet cord in the window through which you let us down. And you shall gather into your house, your father, mother, brothers, and all your father's household. That if anyone goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood shall be on his own head and we shall be guiltless. So she, he, they're telling her, you need to gather your family. Don't let them leave the house. If they do, they die. It's not our fault. But if a hand is laid on anyone who is with you in the house, his blood shall be on our head. But if you tell this business of ours, then we shall be guiltless with respect to your oath that you've made us swear. And she said, according to your words, so be it. Then she sent them away and they departed and she tied the scarlet cord in the window. There's a lot of significance as to why they told her to use a scarlet cord. For one thing, prostitutes used to have windows that were painted red. And for her to put out a scarlet cord, it probably wouldn't catch the attention of anybody within the city, but it would be an identifier for the Israelites when they come into Jericho to take the city for them to know that this was an untouchable home. This was the home of Rahab. And of course, we know by this point that the color red or scarlet symbolizes the blood or the blood of Jesus or even the Passover that was on the door frames of the homes. So in a sense, this is a picture of the same thing where the grace and the mercy will be upon the home of Rahab as she has sacrificed her own life and her own safety for the will of the Israelites. And this is a beautiful testament to the fact that God can use anyone. If you turn your life to him, he will use you in powerful ways. Rahab is one of only three women who are mentioned in the lineage of Jesus. She ends up marrying a prince from Judah. This Canaanite prostitute will enter into the inheritance and from her will come our Messiah, our Savior. And in the end, she enters into what we know as the Hall of Faith. Her faith was so big in this moment that it is one that God commemorates in the Bible forever. So never underestimate your life and your faith and what God can do with it.
So they departed. They went into the hills. They remained there the three days until the pursuers returned and the pursuers searched all along the way and found nothing. Then the two men returned. They came down from the hills and they passed over, came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they told him all that had happened to them. And they said to Joshua, truly, the Lord has given all the land into our hands and also all the inhabitants of the land melt away because of us. The interesting thing here is that they sent the spies in on a reconnaissance mission to try to figure out some military strategy on how they would take down Jericho. But what we see here is that this gave them no information about what they should do in order to take it down. That this mission was actually one for the spies to become witnesses and for these spies to essentially save Rahab. So we never know how God is going to use us in specific moments, in times in preparation to witness to people and to save the lives of those that God loves. Chapter three, then Joshua rose early in the morning and they set out from Shittim and they came to the Jordan he and all the people of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. So once again, they are setting up camp. They are setting up an area for them to prepare to enter. At the end of the three days, so this is a separate three days from the three days that we saw before, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. So Joshua knows that they have to be led by the Spirit here, that the Ark of the Covenant must go before them. And he tells them, when you see God, go after it, follow it, get moving. Yet there shall be a distance between you and the Ark of the Covenant, about 2,000 cubits in length or a half mile. So in a sense, this could be Joshua's way of saying, we need to follow the leading of the Lord, but we cannot push him. We cannot be forceful. We need to allow him to be in the distance so that we can see him, so that we can follow him, but not push our own weight onto the Holy Spirit. So do not come near it in order that you may know the way that you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. So again, consecrating me to sanctify, set apart, to prepare yourselves to be holy. Because again, he knows that this is a holy war. This is a spiritual battle before it is a military battle. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. And the Lord said to Joshua, today, I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all of Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. So again, God is reaffirming Joshua's position. He is encouraging him and he is saying they will know by the miracles that take place that you are the leader, that I am your God. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. So he is saying, when you get to the edge, be still and listen. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. So here Joshua is going to be functioning as a prophet, even though he's never called a prophet. He's actually being a prophet here because he's a mouthpiece for the Lord. Come here and listen to the words. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail, without fail, drive out from before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, then the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from the flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So they are going to have to take a step of faith, whereas the Red Sea, it parted before them. They were able to watch the waters part and then go through. But here now, they have to take a bigger step. They actually have to set foot into the water, the raging waters before God will part them and create dry land for them. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped into the brink of the water, 
And here's where it says, now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest, which is in this time, the summer harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap very far away at Adam. So Adam is about 18 miles north. The city is beside, I don't know the name of that. And those flowing down toward the Sea of uh, Araba, the Salt Sea. So this is the, known as the Dead Sea, which is about 1,200 feet below sea level, were completely cut off. Now, there are different thoughts about how this may have happened. One scholar said that this could have been an earthquake. That is one of the widely accepted theories about how this happened, but also the fact that the Jordan flows between limestone cliffs and the fact that perhaps one of the limestone cliffs, there was some sort of rock slide or uh, could have been from that earthquake, but the limestone slid into the river and created a, a dam. So, you know, even though God works miracles, he will still do it in a super but natural way, if that makes sense. And the people passed over opposite of Jericho, because you got to remember, this is millions of people who have to cross here. So that in itself is a miracle. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. So not muddy ground, but dry ground. And all Israel was passing over on dry ground until then all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. So just like the Red Sea, all mil three million or however many people were with them were able to cross. And it wasn't because of what they saw. It was because they walked by faith and not by sight. Chapter four, when all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people from each tribe of man and command them saying, take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodged tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel, whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign or a memorial marker among you. When your children ask in time to come, what do those stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. These stones are going to invoke curiosity in the children. They'll be conversation starters, just the same way that we need to have something to where our children will be curious about the Lord. How does your life, how is your life a memorial marker for your children? And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan, according to the number of tribes, just as the Lord told Joshua, and they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and laid them down there. So these are 12 visible stones that they are going to see outward manifestations of faith. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant had stood, and they are there to this day. So we'll have 12 visible stones but also 12 stones that only God can see that are going to be in the Jordan because when the waters come back over, it will cover those stones. So this will be representing the hidden things of the heart. So not only do we have outward manifestations, people are able to see our faith, but also what's more important is what's going on on the inside of your heart, what's hidden on the inside. For the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. Now the people passed over in haste. So this is simply a uh, reminder or a flashback reflecting on the obedience of the people that once that water parted, they went and they didn't waste any time. And when all the people had finished passing over the ark of the Lord and the priests passed over before the people, the sons of Reuben, the sons of Gad, half tribe of Manasseh, passed over armed before the people of Israel, as Moses had told them. About 40,000 ready for war passed over before the Lord for battle, the plains of Jericho. So here we're seeing the obedience of Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh going to fight alongside their brothers. And on that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all of Israel. So again, affirming his leadership position. And they stood in awe of him just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. And the Lord said to Joshua, command the priest bearing the ark of the testimony to come out, out of the Jordan. 
So Joshua commanded the priests, come up out of the Jordan. And when the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan and the soles of the priests' feet were lifted up on dry ground, the waters of the Jordan then returned to their place and overflowed its banks as before, covering those rocks. Now, when will these people ever see those rocks again or those stones? Potentially when there's drought, when the waters recede, they will see those stones again as a reminder as to how God provided for them. And he will do so again. He will bring the rains again. He will bring the water once again, the refreshing once again. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month meaning the Abib or the Nisan. So this is near the Passover time. And they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And these 12 stones, which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. And he said to the people of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over, so that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. What's really cool here is that Moses being a representation of the law couldn't lead the people into the promised land. Just like the way that we would never be able to enter our own promised land by fulfillment of the law, by human standards. We needed a savior. We needed a Joshua. We needed Jesus. So what the law couldn't do, the spirit was able to fulfill. Lord, we thank you for this new beginning. We thank you for the ability to step out in faith, to step into the water, knowing that you will part the waters, you will make dry ground for us to walk across the Jordan and into the promise. We thank you for Joshua being willing to lead the people. But we most of all thank you for you, Lord, and the way that you told him to be strong and courageous and the way that you continue to say that to us today. But it is never a command that doesn't have a promise attached to it that you will be with them, that you will be with us knowing that you won't leave us, that you will give us everything we need to fight the battles that are ahead. Because you don't say that once we enter into the promise that it's going to be an easy road after that. No, there's battles ahead. There are things we've got to do. There's territory to take hold of. There's enemies to drive out. So help us to continue to keep our eyes on you and to trust you the entire way. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heaven is a divine gift to us that is given by grace. We're not going to get it because we are indeed righteous. We are getting it because God loves us. But again, we will not receive that promised land. We will not receive that gift of eternal life if we don't receive Jesus. So I wanna give someone that opportunity today who is saying, I've never done that. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna go after I die, but I see now that that is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer I'm gonna put the words on the screen so you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and when you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died and he rose again, then you will be saved. So let's pray this prayer, believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came you died and you rose again. I thank you that all of my sins are forgiven. I confess of my sin, I turn from them, and I live my life for you. So I receive you now as Lord and Savior of my life. I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.